a pleasant Wednesday afternoon to everybody listening to us here on the poorly produced Brandon Warren Podcast Project. We're coming to you almost live on a drizzly Wednesday afternoon. Off season just underway for your Minnesota Twins, and obviously coming off the heels of a pretty exciting game between the Royals and the A's last night. There's a lot of people that uh, have a lot to say, and we're all pretty excited about the direction that the game is going. Hopefully, tonight's game between the Pirates and the Giants can hold up somewhat that level of excitement. I, I publicly said I wouldn't want my season resting on the right arm of Edinson Volquez, who's had a fine season, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, he's not Garrett Cole and he's not Francisco Liriano. But that's not really important to what we're talking about today. Maybe we'll get back to that another day or another time. Today, basically what I want to talk about for the third podcast here is off-season direction for the Minnesota Twins. And the biggest thing being, of course, you know, what what do the Twins need to do to move forward, to get to a point where fans want to come to the stadium again, for crying out loud. And it's there's a lot of different things in play. I think part of what is spurring me to this direction especially this early in the off season when guys won't even declare for free agency until after the World Series is over in a few weeks, it was the Bob Sansevier piece in the Pioneer Press today about how Joe Maurer is basically a sissy and should go back to catching. Now, you can you can get into a lot of different ways of how that that column was not good. It just it just wasn't good, but. Moving Joe Maurer off first base should be something the Twins, if they're a forward-thinking organization, should explore. Now, the one thing we as fans or people outside of the organization don't know is where is he at physically. He's always been kind of a stiff mover, and so to that end, it's, it's really hard to know how he would alter or adjust to a different position. But at the end of the day, it comes down to Miguel Cabrera played third base, and Joe Maurer is a better athlete than, than Miguel Cabrera, even at this point in their careers. They're, they're virtually the same age. I think I think Joe Maurer is no doubt a better athlete at this point, and there's no reason Joe Maurer can't maybe not necessarily play third base, but left field, right field, try something out just to kind of maintain some of that positional flexibility or positional value that he loses by standing over first base, which is nothing to say of the fact that they may want Kenny Vargas to play first, Josmiel Pinto to DH or flip-flop those guys. Find a way to get Pinto's bat into the lineup. One way or another, because it sure doesn't seem to be behind the plate. So when you step forward and try to put out an off-season direction for the Twins, and we like to do our off-season blueprints, guys, Twins Daily does them, and Aaron Gleeman and all those guys, they like to do their their off-season blueprints to kind of lay out how they would approach the Twins off-season if they were sitting in the GM's chair. But I think... Until you decide what you're doing with Joe Maurer, and even if that's nothing, leaving him at first base and just understanding that that's what you got to do, fine. That that's it's action by inaction basically. Now I think the Twins need to reinvent the wheel a little bit there and and try to move Joe Maurer, but at the end of the day, I, I don't see that happening necessarily. So from from that point on, I think you know you have to you have to identify. Who is going to be where for how long? Because you're not going to address third base if, one, you expect Trevor Plouffe to come back healthy, two, you expect Miguel Sano coming up quickly, and three, you're okay with Eduardo Escobar filling in at third base in the meantime. So it's a, it's kind of a tangled, messy web because of... Let me just say it's it's in a good way because you've got a lot of players in this Twins organization that have positional flexibility. And I'm not just talking about the Eduardo Nunez of the world or the Eduardo Escobars, but Trevor Plouffe can play third base, can play first base, can play the corner outfield spots. Danny Santana, and this is something I've said from the get-go, find a way to stave off any regression from him by plugging and playing him all over the map, good matchups for him, and and maybe the game comes in. Maybe he really is as good as he played this year. Now, I, I don't think he is. I think that would be a very tall task for him to repeat any semblance of the success that he had. But at the same time, he is a guy who deserves to have 400, 500 plate appearances next year if, if he plays like he did this year, or, or at least 
have that expectation coming into spring that if he continues to play well, well, why shouldn't he play? So give him give him a bag full of gloves. Let him play left field. Let him play center field. Let him play short. Let him play third. Let him play second. And plug and play. Use him kind of like a Ben Zobris. Now, he, he's obviously not as good as Ben Zobris, and maybe nobody in the history of baseball is as good as Ben Zobris when it comes to playing different positions at, at that level. But that's what a forward-thinking organization does. They find spaces for guys and and just roll with it. From from there, what's difficult is you look at this Twins team and you see a squad that was not good this year. I, I get that. And so when I talk to people on the national side, they're they're like, oh, sign three free agents, go get these. It's like, but at the same time, you you realize that if you look at the positions where the twins are weak, they have help coming up through the pipeline or bodies that can that can fill in there. There's the makings, there's the skeleton or the shell of a pretty doggone good baseball team in in Minneapolis right now. Now, what is what is difficult is to know which buttons to push and where. Maybe you go get a guy for one year, like a David Murphy type, to play a corner outfield spot to keep it warm, to make Aaron Hicks go back to AAA and force that guy off that position. I, I don't know how the Twins envision that or view that. I'm not going to pretend to say that I do either. But basically then what you need to do is come up with one position you can address. Because I think it's fair to say the Twins should probably either sign a shortstop. If they really don't believe Danny Santana is a shortstop, go sign a shortstop. There's going to be a bunch of them available this offseason, starting at the top with Hanley Ramirez and at the bottom with guys like Jed Lowry and J.J. Hardy. And, and, and I, I know people are freaking out saying, what do you mean those guys are at the bottom? I'm saying if you're going to sign anybody beneath that threshold of competence, stay away. Why even bother? Just plug and play Eduardo Escobar, Danny Santana, Eduardo Nunez for all I care. If you're just going to plug and play guys, if you're going to go and sign somebody that's not better than those guys are, there's no sense in spending the dough. So if it's not going to be shortstop, it needs to be outfield. And it's not necessarily for a long-term thing because I like Eddie Rosario. I like Byron Buxton. Who doesn't like Byron Buxton? But at the same time, you've got Oswaldo Arcia and then who? Aaron Hicks is, is still a question mark. I still, more than just about anybody else, love Aaron Hicks. I think he can be a big league regular. But even in a September showcase, so to speak, when he was supposedly so much better, he, he still didn't show enough that you say, yeah, that's my left fielder. That's my center fielder. That's a guy I'm going to give 500, 600 plate appearances to. So, uh, excuse me here. <clears throat> I would... And I would I would go out and sign Colby Rasmus uh, of the Toronto Blue Jays, and the reason I would do that is I I banged the drum really hard for Phil Hughes last year, and that turned out pretty good. Now it doesn't mean that I've got some kind of special intel on Colby Rasmus or, or anything like that, but young free agents coming off down years, you bank on a rebound, you sign them under market value, which is hard to do in any free agent market. I mean, if if Phil Hughes had this year. And then hit the free agent market, he's getting easily double what he gets from the Twins. Not only probably in terms of dollars per year and years, but overall salary. I guess that, that, technically speaking, that makes sense. He might get six years and he might get $16 million per year. So the Twins are, are definitely fortunate to have, have Phil Hughes. And that should be their goal, is to find more Phil Hugheses. That is, guys who are undervalued coming off of bad seasons, who they can make whatever adjustments or alterations to get that player to be successful. If playing Colby Rasmus against right-handers and playing left field can turn him into an 800 OPS guy, by all means, give it a try. Now, do you sign him to a one-year deal or a three-year deal? I, I don't know. I haven't broken that down. Personally, I think maybe you go with one year, $5 million, have options. They're not options, but um, incentives, excuse me. At like four, five, and six hundred plate appearances with a vesting option at six hundred for a higher salary, meaning if he plays well, you bring him back the next year for ten million, and maybe the next year after that for twelve. It's a guy who's madly talented, and so if you take a chance, you take a chance and buy low on guys like that. And if you sign him to a deal where you can cut the cord after one year, you saw it with Kendris, Kendris Morales, or Tendry Morales. Sorry, the 
taking a chance on a guy who has high impact. The floor on one-year deals is the guy walks away at the end of the year and no harm, no foul. So hopefully, you know, those are the, the two things on the position player side. As far as starting pitchers go, yeah, I, I would look at a starting pitcher, and I've got plenty of questions here on Twitter and Facebook. Do you go for Scherzer? Do you go for Lester? Do you go for Shields? And I think the answer is no. I like all three of those guys for different reasons. Uh, Scherzer, I think, wants the most money of them. I think Lester gets the most money because he won't have a qualifying offer, and thus his market will be a little more robust. I think Shields is the safest on the on the basis of throwing all those innings and and being healthy. But at the same time, you don't know if he's a Bronson Arroyo who will pitch into his late 30s throwing that many innings either. So there's always some level of risk with free agent pitchers. And so if I'm the Twins, I target somebody lower. I don't know that there's a Phil Hughes, so to speak. I still like Brandon McCarthy coming from the Yankees, but I think he blew his market out of the water with how well he pitched on the in the Bronx down the stretch. He's probably going to get three years and, and at least $10 million per year, if not Ricky Nolasco-type money which is a sore spot for Twins fans, no doubt. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. i got a couple minutes left here. Let's, let's break down some questions that have come in on the Twitter and Facebook wires. Pete wants to know, with a youth movement on the horizon, do you see the Twins finding trade suitors for some of the veteran players, or will they let the contracts expire to make room? That's a great question. We, we've seen Justin Morneau out, basically his contract up. He was, he was more or less going to be a free agent within a month anyway. Now, Josh Willingham, gone. At this point, though, there aren't a lot of huge expiring contracts. I think Jared Burton you might see gone. The Twins just say, look, thanks, but no thanks. Or, you know, thanks for your thanks for your time. It's time to go on to do something different. And then that's fine. With relievers, once they're not effective anymore, you just move on. And the Twins have a great minor league system for relievers. Starting at the top, working the way bottom. I mean, even if you fill in with guys like Lester Oliveros and Ryan Presley, there's a non-zero chance that those guys are both better than Jared Burton wherever he's pitching next year. So you may as well take that chance if you don't expect to be all that great. I don't think the Twins will be better than 500 unless they make some crazy moves this offseason. Uh, friend Danny says, do whatever we did in the last offseason when the Twins previously fired a manager. Worst to be first would be worst to first would be good again. Yeah, that was back in the, the mid-80s, and things were a little different then. Uh, little point here, though. Going and getting... Uh, Jeff Raritan before the 87 season that's uh that's wild I mean that's that's really when you think about a team that's coming off such a bad season and they decide oh we need a closer that's that's crazy stuff and that's something I've never really thought about that way so it's um it, it, it to, to repeat 1987 that'd be a tall task but at the same time this is a team that has the framework like I said to to improve and by a lot i think this american league central division is going to be a lot of fun the next couple years because the white Sox and indians are going to have the pitching to stick with anybody and in case you forgot kansas city and detroit were at the top of this division so uh, all five teams have a, a future that is at least somewhat bright in fact i think if any team doesn't have such a bright future it's detroit just because of the money they have tied into veterans and and the positions they would need to fill but they can always still cash their problems, too. A couple other questions here. How much money do the Twins have to spend on, and which starting pitchers will they spend on? From George Murphy and Phil Weiss, again, chiming in for a second straight day. To Scherzer or not to Scherzer or Lester or Shields? Kind of touched on that a little bit. I don't think they'll go for any big-name guys. I think a Jason Hamill or maybe a Francisco Liriano, but I think he gets the qualifying offer from the Pirates, meaning... You have to give up a first, well, in the Twins' case, a probably a second-round pick to, to, or maybe it's a sandwich pick. I, I never know exactly the rules there. It, I, I just don't see it. I don't think the Twins will, will be in on Liriano. I think they've kind of moved on from that. And that's too bad because Liriano's had some, some pretty nice seasons. So I, I think they'll go with the lower tier, guys like Hamill, guys like maybe, maybe McCarthy. But... In the end, they don't really need to address it. we got 30 seconds left here. Let's take one more question, and that's odds that the Twins go external for a manager, and will they get anything out of Buxton or Sano in 2015? I'm going to say not a whole lot from Buxton and Sano. I think they're both going to need plenty of time in the minor leagues this coming season. As far as going external, I am, I have no idea. I'm leaning Paul Molitor, probably 60% Paul Molitor, but I have no idea. Anyway, thanks for listening, and hope you can listen again soon.